Welcome back. Uh, in the previous video, we discussed how international trade leads to a convergence of relative prices between uh, cloth and food. We also um, talked about uh, how producers and consumers uh, in home and foreign responded to that change. Okay. Now, uh, in this video, we're going to talk about the distributional uh, effect of trade. Okay. And um, once again, we start with the change in relative price of cloth to food because of international trade. Okay. We're still going to rely upon uh, the same graphical tool uh, we used before. Okay. And um, we start once again we focused on uh home economy here okay starting from point a all right that's where um, um the home's economy uh was okay before trade and uh because of trade or when home and foreign open up their doors to each other and as we said before uh home is going to export cloth because uh, the cloth production is labor intensive, right? And home is uh, uh, abandoned in labor, right? So we find here on the left hand side of this uh, graph uh, where the, uh, the home economy is moving from A to B along this curve, okay? In other words, uh, we're going to see a higher relative price of cloth in home, all right? And because of that, as we said, um, the cloth uh, industry in home would expand. They're going to produce more cloth, okay, and export them to uh, foreign to make a higher profit, right? Now, because um, along with the uh, expansion of the cloth industry uh, they're going to use more labor right so there are uh, there is a higher demand for labor which will push up um, the price of labor uh, w here right so uh, we find that the uh, w over r ratio would increase uh, during this process okay now uh, when labor becomes more expensive relatively, okay, and capital becomes relatively cheaper, then we would say in both cloth and food industry, they tend to use uh, less amount of labor and more of capital, right? And um, that would lead to a smaller uh, L to K ratio in both industries. So that's why here uh, we see they're moving, both are moving up along their curve. All right. And so this is how the change in relative factor prices, W over R, um, change the input choices of these firms. Okay. And what happens to the welfare of labor and capital owners? Um, this should be very straightforward. Okay. Now here, the only thing we need to uh, bear in mind is we cannot just look at W over P, for example, when we look at the welfare of labor, right? And we are supposed to look at the real wage, which is W over P. However, here, as we said, both W and P, no matter its price of cloth or price of food, are changing simultaneously, right? So we really don't know, like, you know, that ratio would go up or go down, okay? And similarly, we cannot look at the real rental price, uh, R over P, because both R and P are changing here. But the good news is, remember, we said in the long run, W over P, equals marginal product of labor, right? R over P, real rental price, equals marginal product of capital, 
So MPL and MPK would give us a pretty easy way to figure out the welfare of these factors. Um, so the change in real wage and change in rental price. Remember, there's a very important thing we discussed before. It's called LDR, Law of Diminishing Returns, right? We know that, you know, the um, returns, the marginal um, uh, returns of a factor, either capital or labor, uh, would decline when we use more of that factor, right? So here, remember, we discussed the input choices made by firms. In both industries, firms tend to use uh, less amount of labor because it becomes more expensive, nominally, right? Now, when we use less amount of labor, of course, MPL would go up, right? MPL would go up. And uh, so the W over PC, that's a real wage in terms of the uh, price of crop and real wage in terms of food would both rise, okay? Once again, because we use fewer units of labor, so the remaining uh, labor would be more productive because of diminishing returns. And when its productivity goes up, it should get a higher pay. So the real wage in terms of the prices of, of food and cloth would both go up. Okay. Similarly, we will find the rental price uh, would go down. Okay, remember this is because in both food and cloth industries they use more of capital. Now, because of the diminishing returns to capital, then uh, the the um, last unit of capital added uh, would be less productive, right? So their um, real rental price would decrease. Now, using layman's term here, we could say workers are better off and capital owners are worse off. Okay, this is so-called Stoper Samuelson theorem. Okay, it's named after uh, two economists. Uh, this theorem says the abandoned factor gains from trade, the scarce factor loses from trade. Once again, trade creates winners and losers okay and um, in international trade or on the global market because a country tends to export uh, the product which uses um, its abandoned factor more okay so um, the uh, the industry of that factor um, or, or that product expands and that's how the abandoned factor gains uh, from trade, okay? And of course, the other factors which uses the scarce uh, factor, uh, I'm sorry, the other industry which uses the scarce factor uh, tend to shrink. So that's why they lose uh, from trade, okay? Now, um, upon this moment, we already learned a lot of um, important conclusions, okay, about output, relative prices, uh, winners and losers, or welfare of labor and capital owners, right? Uh, but there's a very important fundamental question uh, we want to answer. That is, in reality, which country is abandoned in which factor, right? Because the hector only model tells us that, you know, the pattern of trade or the distribution of income um, are determined by uh, the abundance of factors of production, right? Or abundance of resources. Now, how could we measure that? For example, U.S. is abandoned in which factor? Capital, labor, technology, land, which one? And how could we approach these uh, empirically, okay? How could we even test it? Now here, we're showing you this uh, interesting figure, okay? 
Now, you see uh, like six different factors uh, presented here from physical capital to R&D scientists, skilled labor, less skilled labor, illiterate labor, and arable land. Okay. And uh, these six factors, what we're showing you is uh, for these economies uh, in the rest of the world, um, how much they have um, in terms of their share in total uh, endowment of the world. Now, for example, when we look at the United States, the red uh, part or the red bars, okay, and uh, if we look at the physical capital, we find that United States uh, has about 24% of the world's physical capital. Okay, R&D scientists, uh, U.S. has a 26.1% of the world's uh, uh, R&D scientists. Okay. Once again, all of these uh, numbers you see are the shares uh, of each country in the world's total endowment. Okay? Now, you also see in the last uh, bar here, or the column, um, the, the, uh, is the GDP, okay? the output. For example, here, the U.S. output accounts for about 21.6% of the world's total GDP. Now we we want to why we want to use the GDP here, because we we are gonna define the abundance of the factor on the basis of this one. We're gonna use the GDP share as the benchmark. For example, uh, we're gonna say that you know if um, a factor's share, uh, if a country's uh, share of that factor is greater than its share in world's GDP, then that country is abandoned in that factor. Okay. Once again, let's uh, talk about the physical capital. Okay. So U.S. accounts for 24% of the world's total physical capital endowment. Uh, but the U.S. output accounts for only 21.6% of the world's total uh, GDP. This number is smaller than this one. That means, by definition, your U.S. is abandoned in physical capital. Okay. Now let's look at the, another example: less skilled labor. Okay. Uh, the U.S. Um, has about 4.9 percent of the world's total less skilled labor. Uh, but its output accounts for about 21.6%, right? So this number is far less than the output share. That means U.S. is not abandoned in less skilled labor. Or you could say the U.S. is scarce uh, in less skilled labor. Okay. Now here, this this figure helps us, you know, um, has the a pretty clear uh, idea about which country is abandoned in which factor. But there are two quick questions we want to leave for you guys to think about. Okay? Uh, the first one is um, which, uh, why here we use a country's share of that factor? Why not use just the absolute amount? Okay. In other words, the physical capital, what's the absolute amount the U.S. has? Uh, the, when we look at the arable land, for example, why not use the, air, the absolute amount, right? Like how many acres we have. Uh, why we need to compare with the world's total endowment of that factor? Okay, So that's the first uh, question. right? Why use the relative term instead of the absolute one? The second question is why would it compare its share, uh, compare the uh, share of the factor to that of uh, the world's GDP, right? We said that, you know, if, if this uh, share is greater than the output share, then it, we said it's abandoned. If it's less, then it's uh, scarce. Why we 